Good afternoon, and welcome to our program. I want to thank uh, Dr. Barbara Ackermills for the idea of this program. Uh, we met uh, sometime last year and uh, began to trade ideas, and she said, well, why don't we do a joint recital? And I said, well, sure, why not? And so we are delighted to be here, and it's, it's fortuitous, you might say, uh, that uh, Tuskegee University is now going to offer again degrees in music beginning in the fall. Uh, students can uh, apply and gain admission to uh, studies for Bachelor of Arts degrees in music and Bachelor of Arts degrees in visual arts. So you will be seeing many more of these types of concerts and hearing many more of these types of presentations. So we're delighted to have you here today. Dr. Gray, thank you so much for being here, our Dean of the Chapel. I uh, see you and I see Dr. and Mrs. Frederick, thank you so much. I, I don't know, uh, I may miss someone, <laughs> but please uh, forgive me. But thank you so much for being here and without further ado, I will turn the program over to Dr. Acker Mills. Thank you, Dr. Barr. I'll be starting the program with three Chopin preludes. Chopin was a romantic composer, and one of the hallmarks of his music are very lyrical lines. It almost sounds like my right hand is singing most of the time. It is usual to use a lot of rubato in this music, too, so you'll hear me speeding up and slowing down a little bit. The first prelude is rather slow in tempo. The second one is quite fast. It's over in about 30 seconds, fast and furious. And then the third one, you may recognize, it's fairly popular. Its nickname is the raindrop prelude, and you'll hear a constant pulse throughout the whole piece. So those are some things to listen for in these three Chopin preludes.
Thank you. Next, I'll be playing Mozart. He was a classical composer, and I think you will immediately see the difference in styles between classical, the classical period style and the romantic period style. This is only one of two minor sonatas that Mozart wrote. Uh, most of his music is quite happy and buoyant and joyful. This sonata is not. In fact, it's almost like Beethoven. It's very stormy and furious. Um, lots of big dynamics, which is quite atypical of Mozart's music. Some think he wrote this piece in response to his mother's death. He did write it about five months after she died in Paris. So that could be a possible reason for the fury of this piece. Um, the third movement is very furious, very driving, but there is maybe 45 seconds of basically real sunshine in the last movement of the piece. And I'd like you to listen for that few minutes of sunshine in the third movement.
Louis Vierne, French late romantic composer uh, of the French symphonic school. He was a student of César Franck, who was uh, uh, a teacher of many of the French romantic uh, organists. Uh, later studied with Charles Marie Vidor. Um, many of us may be familiar with uh, Vidor's Staccata, which is uh, heard frequently. It, it's, it's one of the most uh, more played and heard Vidor organ works. Uh, but uh, Vierne uh, was one of the masters, as I said, of the uh, symphonic organ music. Um, up to this point, the organ was used as a substitute for the symphony, okay, the, the orchestra uh, with the various instruments. And the, or the organist would be called upon frequently to imitate uh, the orchestra uh, because in many places uh, the orchestra wasn't that readily accessible. So they would transcribe organ symphonies. These uh, artists began to write for the, for, the, for the organ in an idiomatic way, okay, as if it were its own little symphony, and use the, the resources on the organ uh, as if it were, you know, so you, you have the reeds uh, against the principles, et cetera, et cetera and uh, just really making use of, uh, of the organ as it is, as the instrument is. Um, this symphony, the second symphony, uh, was written in the early 1900s, 1902, 1903, and uh, it really begins to show how the organists begin to really use the pedal board of the organ in a more involved, inclusive way. So, uh, you know, quite, uh, what's the word, more involved, and rather than just a pedal point here, the organ, the, the, the pedal become an intricate part of the music and the development. So, Vierne.
Next we come to Bach. This next uh, piece, again, is another one of Bach's uh, popular organ works. Uh, we do not have the original manuscript, so there is still a question as to whether it's actually by Bach or not. But it's a fun piece. It's, uh, if it is by Bach, it's uh, one of his early works. Um, and in the style of uh, one of uh, the French dances, Bach was very much influenced uh, by uh, the French Baroque music of the day, of his day. And uh, he would write suites. He wrote uh, keyboard suites, French suites, English suites. Um, so this is in one of the styles, uh, the style of one of the, uh, the movements of a French suite, the gigue, uh, usually the last movement uh, of the suite. And it's a, a fugue, gigue fugue. It has a, a very active uh, fugal subject. Um, it, you might think of it in, in triplets, pam, pa, pim, pa, pam, pa, pim, pa, da, just dancing along. So dance, if you will.
The next piece is uh, a transcription of an improvisation. This piece, uh, he knows just how much we can bear, uh, is an improvisation unto him. He knows just how much we can bear, or we are our Heavenly Father's children. And uh, it, was, uh, it was performed by Mr. Henry Sexton. Uh, he was the minister of music organist at Concord Baptist Church in Harlem, New York. And uh, this performance was transcribed by Mr. Raymond Henry. Um, Concord Baptist Church has a pipe organ, and but what you are here, what you hear, is something that's you might say more idiomatic to the Hammond organ. Uh, so it would not be unusual to hear this being played on a Hammond organ. So Mr. Sexton just uh, adapted the pipe organ and uh, used a lot of vernacular. Uh, vernacularisms, as I might say, uh, that you might hear in the black church in interpolating uh, this hymn. I just want to read you the first verse. We are our Heavenly Father's children, and we all know that he loves us one and all. Yet there are times when we find we, when we, find we answer another voice, another's voice and call. If we are willing, he will teach us his voice only to obey, no matter where. And he knows, yes, he knows just how much we can bear.
The next piece is a duo for piano and organ. It's something that my brother sent me last summer, and I looked at it, had never heard of the composer, had never heard of the piece, which I think is when I got in touch with Dr. Barr and said, can we read through this, see what it sounds like. So we decided it's a pretty nice piece. Then I tried to find out something about the composer, because as a musician, you try to find out what was going on socially and culturally when the piece was written. I could not find anything about the piece or the composer until last week I came across somebody's master's thesis <laughs> from Arizona State University and he had written this big long dissertation about Clifford Demarest. I found out some interesting things. Um, first of all, this piece is one of his better known pieces. It's also one of the first serious organ piano duos that was ever written. And interestingly enough, he was organist at a church in New York City. It was a Unitarian church. And Demarest and the minister of this church both were very active in the Harlem Renaissance and in the formation of the NAACP. I hope you enjoy this piece for piano and organ.
Okay, this next piece, uh, well, it was composed by Bach's last and least son. And I say that in the most endearing of ways because Bach himself never mentioned him. Okay. Uh, if you look at the dates in the program, he seemed to have lived backwards in time. Uh, but. We owe all of this to Professor Peter Schickele, who uh, unearthed this work and the uh, works of this composer. Quite unusual works. Uh, this piece, the Toot Suite, makes some interesting use of instruments that we don't normally hear on the classical stage. Uh, you will hear the whistle, okay? very creative in his uh, use of instruments. The, it's three movements. You see the pre-loud. I think that was his attempt at a prelude. Uh, the, second, uh, the second movement, uh, the chorale. The OK chorale, right? Yes, uh, well, again, these are all works that you would find in, uh, in classical music, uh, the first piece I played, chorale. Okay, nothing unusual about that. But he had to make it the OK chorale. And uh, a chorale is another term for him. And he does make use of a folk tune, okay, as his hymn. Uh, you may recognize Swing Low Sweet Chariot, which again is quite forward-looking for him uh, because uh, these uh, 
uh, spirituals were not well known at the time. In fact, uh, very few people, if anyone, were was paying any attention to them. He used this one. Uh, he also makes reference to uh, another hymn. You may hear uh, a snippet of Onward Christian Soldiers in the second movement. And then he goes to the fair, you know, and then, wait a minute, what, where are we? Anyway, uh, the last movement makes use of uh, the folk song, the Russian folk song, Volga Boatman. And uh, he also makes uh, much use of the whistle uh, during this one. It's again in the style of a fugue. And uh, well, that's about all I can say about uh, PDQ Bach. Thank you.
The final piece is by Max Reger, again, the late 19th century, early 20th century composer this time uh, from Germany. Uh, Max Reger, uh, the running joke around among organists is that uh, the, page is <laughs> the page is covered with notes. There are thick chords everywhere. Max Reger, uh, whereas uh, Vierne is into lines, Max Reger is into the, the harmonic uh, emphasis more than, the, more than the lyric. He, of course, is, is lyric as well, but uh, extremely chromatic use of uh, many diminished chords. Um, but anyway, uh, getting technical. Um, this piece, Introduction and Passacaglia, is one of his best known organ works. It does not have an opus number uh, when uh, composers' works are cataloged, they gave them a, give them a number. This one does not have a number, but uh, it begins, as it says, with a brief introduction about 16 measures long. And the Passacaglia is a slow dance in 3 4 time. Uh, it's based upon a ground or a repeated melodic line, usually about eight measures long, uh, and usually you, you hear it in the bass, in this case on the organ pedals. It stays there, it, it does not, it's not modified in any way, it just is repeated over and over again. Uh, it is stated by itself in the pedal and then follows a series of 12 variations uh, or manual, in, in the manuals, in the hands. Uh, with each variation, it gets increasingly louder and louder and louder. And just when you think he couldn't give you any more, he does. Uh, it's in D minor. The very last variation ends in a sunshine D major. And I hope it remains this way for the rest of the day. Rager, Introduction and Pascalio. 